be conquered that much.
everybody, and especially anybody who is doing painting gatherings or having painting conversations. Nice to meet you.
Um, I think it's time for another congregational song. Yes. This time it's going to be in the Peak Book. That is number 15. Songs to be sung. <coughs> 15 in the Peak Uh, this is like a, a Mozart tune that you'll probably recognize when, uh, when you hear it. We don't do this one real often. Maybe play it through once the music. Yeah, do you want, I'll, I'll sing the first first once and then and then everybody can sing it the second time. Right. There are still songs to be sung.
Well, this is a very important one. I, in fact, thought it was today, but I <laughs> know. <laughs> Daylight Savings Time starts next Saturday night. Oh, be sure and set your clocks. Although, if you've got a cell phone, a, a smartphone, it'll do it for you if that's how you get up in the morning. But be sure and set your clock so that you know when to get here on the proper time next week. They like savings time next Saturday night. Tell me when our adjustments were in only one hour. We always set aside the time in our service for us to be able to um, have moments of silence, a time when, as you choose, you may pray, meditate, simply go inside yourself. But it's just about three or four or five minutes that we're going to spend in quiet together. We do have candles on either side of the sanctuary. If you move about, just please do it respectfully, please. I'll ring the chimes when it's time to come back together. Will it stand throughout? 
Share quotes on aging. I do think that when it comes to aging, we're held to a different standard than men. <clears throat> Some guy said to me, don't you think you're too old to sing rock and roll? <laughs> I said, you'd better check with Mick Jagger. <laughs> Sally Field said on aging, I've gathered strength behind my years. I've owned them, I've earned them, I've deserved them. I have a right to have them. And then Dolly Parton says, now people are always asking me, what do you want to say, what do you want people to say about you 100 years from now? I always say, I want them to say, dang, don't she still look good for her age? <laughs>
our local paper, the AJC, published 10 ideas, 10 ideas for celebrating Women's History Month across Atlanta with what was described as a slew of events that we could enjoy. A slew of events we could enjoy, including a women-led beer talk and tasting, a women's comedy festival, a women's open mic and poetry slam, and yes, oh, one lecture on the role of women in the railroads, a city winery girls' night out, and a buy one, get one free national jewelry promotion. A month spotlighting contemporary women, I mean, it did, it does, but not the Women's History Month its founders probably envision. I'm kind of keep going to say, you think? And lots of what's trending in women's lives today, but only a very slight nod to influential women of yesterday. Our elders in the struggle to obtain equality of the sexes. Our elders in the struggle to obtain equality, perhaps, for all. Speaking of influential women, or more precisely, influencers, how many of you know who they are? Oh, I know it's Percy, not any of you. <laughs> Another article this week profiled Lynn Slater, a 70-year-old former professor of social work at Fordham University, who, who portrays her post-social work life not in terms of events and accomplishments, but as a series of what she calls happy accidents, leading to her later life identity as an influencer. Influencers get paid to influence. So what they wear, what perfume, and what they do in their life is meant to influence other people. So the fact that she's 70 years old is kind of unusual. Who through her fashion blog, the accidental icon, has filled a big hole for women of her age, for my age. Women she describes mostly as urban, intellectual, and invested in their lives and careers. Leading all of a sudden for her to followers all over the world to magazine shoots and modeling and working with emerging designers, all kind of heavy stuff, and a profound crisis as she was living a very controlled or influenced by others digital life, mostly a life that was digital, learning as she admits how living under the cyber magnifying glass sucked her in and compromised her values. I don't judge influencers especially elder influencers, and the death a few days ago of interior and clothing designer and geriatric starlet and self-described black belt shopper and pioneer life influencer Iris Apfel at age 102 will be a loss for those of us who admired and emulated and saw as permission giving the bold style that she cultivated over her life. No tweed career suiting for her, but oversized black rimmed glasses and huge chunky bracelets and flowing captains. And boy, I've seen some stuff on the wall that she would have just loved and I'm buying them. <laughs> and Frida over there, by the way, she's going today. <laughs> Not an activist in the way that we usually define activist. In the words of Retz Morgan, first, avenging the suffering of our ancestors, second, earning the respect of future generations, and third, being transformed by the work. But she was an activist just the same, in a way that I believe might make history in her own liberating fashion, pun intended. And the death this past week, also a writer and historian, Janice Rothschild Blomberg, at age 100, who had long ago outlived and out accomplished the label of being the widow of Jacob Rothschild, who had been the rabbi of the temple here in Atlanta at the time of the civil rights movement, and the temple bombing that garnered so much worldwide attention in 1958. It was the Rothschilds who almost single-handedly organized an integrated celebratory dinner for Martin Luther King Jr. after he was awarded the Nobel Prize. And Janice, after her first husband's death, who continued on in fierce support of civil rights, 
who created a sisterhood of women leaders, including a cohort of black women whose histories have been, had been overshadowed and largely ignored, including Ella Baker, how many of you know Ella Baker, who died in 1986, whose largely behind the scenes efforts as an organizer spanned more than 50 years working alongside male luminaries like Thurgood Marshall and Martin Luther King Jr. and mentoring many emerging activists such as Diane Nash, Stokely Carmichael, Bob Moses, who were leaders of the Southern Nonviolent Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or SNCC, who opposed what she saw as I love this, quote, the prevailing male messianic style <laughs> of the period and urged a more collectivist model of leadership what we might see today as an intersectional, womanist approach to forming a true grassroots movement for change instead of such a top-down hierarchy that the males in the movement continue to promote. About whom and other women of color in our history I have been rightfully called in and called out for diminishing in my own telling of the role of women in American history. In my time, I have not paid enough attention to the black women in history, and I am accepting being called in and called out for this. When my oldest children, who are now well into middle age, were young, I used to tell them that things had not changed that much since I was a kid. We were, after all, the first television generation, even though the sets our parents proudly purchased were huge and only black and white and only showed a handful of programs. I can remember Disney on Sunday night. We had fast food hamburger drive-ins, I told my kids, and interstate freeways and even diet sodas. We had top 40 rock and roll, we had polio shots, and we had all, always had fluoride in the water the invisible chemical that helps prevent tooth decay. Or at least so I assume. When my son went to China as a college student and came back with a lot of wonderful impressions, but some not so wonderful, like the rotten condition of even young people's teeth, because they didn't have fluoride in the water, I assured him smugly that the attitude in the water was something we had taken care of in this country a long time ago. Stay with me, this is going somewhere. Not so, I have come to learn. It was not until the 1950s in this country when a very few communities began adding fluoride to their drinking water. Even despite the proven benefits, whether there is a fluoride in a water system has remained almost strictly a local decision, with six out of ten communities who have put the decision to a vote voting against it. Voting against putting fluoride in the water, something so benign, many people feeling that the dangers outweigh the benefits. And furthermore, they never want the government telling them how to run their lives, including what is healthy or not for them. It's a matter of personal choice, opponents argue. And besides, once you legislate fluoride in the water, who knows what other kinds of dubious and radical changes might be approved and forced on people. Uh, Today, more than 70 years after the scientific proof that fluoride greatly improves dental health and the benefit of society far outweighs the risk, many places still not have, have not permitted the additive and worldwide not even half the people have had the benefit of this advance, especially in poor and developing countries. Now, what you might be asking, does a discourse on fluoridated water have to do with the discussion of the history of feminism, religious or secular? How many of you have been wondering? <laughs> Metaphorically, a great deal. Because for a generation of young women, in many very basic ways, these young women have never lived a day without feminism. As I have never lived a day without television or without the fluoride that kept my teeth and those of my sons and daughters stronger and less diseased. Not that conventional definitions of and understanding of feminism have been inclusive of trans or binary gender identification or of the intersectionality of race, class, and gender oppression. It hasn't been. But, however inadequate, incomplete, spotty, and myopic, gender justice work has been done. 
It's with us. It's there. It's been in our waters for so many years, carried out in part over our American history by elder women who at times been venerated and at times have been mistrusted simply because they were over the age of 30. <laughs> A pantheon of our elders who have put feminism in our waters from Martha Washington to Margaret Fuller, to the abolitionist Rimke sisters, to black preacher J Jarena Lee, to the first wave feminists who were suffragists, um, including um, all kinds of people, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Mary Church Terrell, a little known African American suffragist, to post Civil War labor organizer Mother Jones, how many of you know her? And early 20th century immigrant community Hull House founder Jane Addams who in her mid and later life fought against segregated housing and capital punishment and on behalf of unwed mothers. And then there were the women who came in with the New Deal, who went to Washington, D.C. during what has been called the one long train wreck of the 1930s, from the stock market crash to dust storms to hard economic times smashing into World War II. Women like, and if you know this person, raise your hand. Women like Barbara Armstrong, the architect of the first social security program in this country. Women like Frances Perkins, who well into middle age became the first female secretary of labor and was considered the force behind enacting the depression era programs who are now are still considered the essential parts of this country's social safety network. So you want to talk about minimum wage, you want to talk about Social Security, you want to talk about so many of the things that came along with the New Deal would not have happened without Frances Perkins, who went into the White House when she was well past middle age and accomplished these reforms. Her friend and fellow rights crusader, Eleanor Roosevelt, a 48-year-old mother of five grown children, when she became first lady, was said to have seen middle-aged even when she was a child, <laughs> and who stayed active through her 70s, always, always so far ahead of her husband on things like immigration, on racial equality, who invited black leaders to confer in the White House. Eleanor Roosevelt was the anti-racist and the person who understood the need for immigration. And Mary McLeod Bethune, central black figure in the Roosevelt administration, described as an inexhaustible educator and civil rights leader, but so little known, so little acknowledged. And then the second wave of feminism generation, who, like my own mother, had been white middle class homemakers and volunteers, and then became enthralled, and then became transformed by the consciousness raising that took place as they read book like, books like Betty Friedan's Feminist Mystique. I will confess to my own deafness and blindness, or rather more accurately, my own deliberate unwillingness as a young woman to enter my mother's adult universe and her discovery of her feminist identity. In fact, my tendency to actively reject it. I did not want to hear her excitement about the changes in her life, because in doing so, I also had to acknowledge the tremendous price she paid, and so many women paid, in a damaged and ultimately broken marriage for her insistence on going back to school and getting a professional job, and moving beyond the identity of Joseph Greenberg's wife and the mother of his four children, and how deeply ingrained and strong the pull of patriarchy and misogyny was on my father and on our whole family. How many of you had similar experiences as you watched that happen? I had to reject her and her life choices, refuse to recognize what she and the few women she found who supported her had done for their daughters because of the natural, developmentally healthy need for our young women to what? Break away and even criticize our mothers and maybe the less healthy tendency to see only what was wrong with our mothers and the tendency to, us, to want us to acknowledge ad nauseum, it sometimes seemed to me, their martyrdom, what they had done for us, and how ungrateful <laughs> we all were. Forgetting conveniently that while we boomers have been doing other things besides being young adults in Berkeley, California, 
And in my case, marching to oppose the war in Vietnam, specifically the draft that threatened to take away and kill my then spouse, my brothers, and so many other men I knew, the generation before us, the women from the so-called great generation, the women from the silent generation, were the ones, they were the ones doing the pro rata abortion rights mark of work from state to state and carrying on the unfinished and still unfinished work of passing an equal rights amendment. They were the ones, not the younger women of my generation. By the way, the ERA began in earnest in 1923 very shortly after the passage of what we now need to call the white women's right to vote, a far more sweeping attempt to end gender discrimination, and it languished for 30 years, taken up by women elected leaders like Martha Griffiths and Shirley Chisholm, who were both well into their own middle ages when it successfully passed Congress, but was never ratified by enough states. So here we have generations of women, elder women, doing the work, and elder women feeling overlooked. <clears throat> so it should not have come as a surprise that I experienced my own version of this when, as a midlife seminarian, I took a class in feminist theology and was told by my at least 25 years younger instructor that she did not want to hear anything more about what we boomers thought of as feminism. <clears throat> that it was long past time to move on, that we had not gotten it right. Oh, oh God. After I walked out and wept, I tried to understand the notion of waves, new ones rolling in over the years. These younger women, these sort of now perhaps fourth waivers, know, though they don't want to have to keep speaking this knowledge, let alone keep thanking older women and men for it, that indeed in the past 50 years, while the ERA did not get ratified, the 70s feminists succeeded more than they failed. The second wave integrated the Little League, police departments, and help wanted ads. It named and achieved legal redress for domestic violence and sexual harassment, and sexual assault, and child sexual abuse, and lesbian custodial rights, and the right to be a single mother by choice. They did this while the ERA failed, much of its intention did not, leading to the Equal Credit Opportunity Act in Title IX guaranteeing equal allocation of money for girls and boys in schools receiving federal aid, and Title X, the National Family Planning Act, and abortion rights, at least for a half century, and so, so much more. In the life of our own <coughs> denomination, the coming of the second wave of feminism not only led to more women in the ministry and in our lay leadership, but an infusion of distinctively feminist themes and ways of being in our congregational life. Feminist theological perspectives, such as those suggested by midlife UU minister Jane Bajorjian, which included process relationism, the sense that everything is always changing and that everything is relational, that is, everything is affected by everything else. The notion that experience is a tool for sense making and stories about our experiences are profoundly spiritual that they are part of an interdependent web of human and non-human life, that our ethics and our theology are always connected, and that words are symbols of the values of our culture. All of these solidly feminist inclinations, would you agree? All of them. We have changed the content of our hymnals and readings to reflect gender inclusivity, and we have suggested ways of doing business, such as in circles, and by consensus to reflect a less hierarchical and inclusive institution as well. <coughs> our daughters and now our granddaughters know all these changes to be true and good, and now they ask us to allow them to find their own ways of creating a new day of feminism by forging rich and respectable, respectful intergenerational partnerships and by demonstrating faith that the torch has passed and it's okay for the torch to pass. Is it okay for the torch to pass? Yes. 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 
These young women have had their own manifesto. I love it. They've had their own manifesto for change for some years now. And they have a specific agenda to cut out, to out unacknowledged feminists and form a voting block of 18 to 40 year olds. Let's hear it for that. <laughs> Support and increase the visibility of bisexual and lesbian and trans women in the feminist movement. To liberate adolescents from sexual harassment and bullying in school, as well as violence in all walks of life. To make workplaces responsive to an individual's wants, needs, and talents, including a living wage for all workers. And again, and again, to pass the ERA so that we can have a constitutional foundation of righteousness and equality upon which future women identified persons rights will stand. <laughs> to recognize that we had failed to acknowledge the role of women of color in our movement for far too long and the challenges they faced historically and are still facing. <laughs> and now, in the aftermath of the unspeakable reversal of Roe v. Wade. As we have done so many times before, we need to take to the street together to take back a basic reproductive right that we were so sure was secured a half century ago. Yeah. These young, passionate, more often lately calling themselves non-binary people, and that is what they want us to call them, have drafted a letter to us older feminists, female and male, and it would be well to heed their words with thanks to the authors of the wonderful book called Manifesta for this adaptation of the letter in this book. Dear older feminists, because we too believe that women can't afford to have another generation's voices go underground, this letter is our way of talking to you above ground rather than bitching about you behind your back. <laughs> if our message were to be boiled down to one bumper sticker, it would be, you are not our mother. <laughs> we repeat you from your mother guilt. You are officially off the hook for not solving the daycare problem or making the world equal. You did make the world a better place, and you continue to do so. We let you off your mother trip and your grandmother trip, and now you have to stop treating us like your daughters and granddaughters. Before criticizing people for their lack of feminism or yourself for what you did not achieve, take a good look at what is out there. Read our books, listen to our podcasts, watch our TikToks, for God's sake, and support our organizations. And when we are righteous, when we are naive, wide-eyed, or annoying, or obsessed with, for example, pronoun identity, think back to your first moments in the movement and the first issues that radicalized you. The notion of feminism, that women have a voice and a power and a will to change, may indeed be like fluoride in the water now, all around us, but mostly invisible. And if so, alleluia, yeah. it is there because of those of us who went before and who remain because of those who go ahead of us. Wherever they choose to go, there is no stopping us now. May it be so.
Let it be so. Thank you all for coming today. I hope you enjoyed it.